at 6 from HTV. Good evening, and tonight, as the rest of us make last-minute preparations, we report on the lucky people who flew off today to spend their Christmas in the sun. Regional airports were packed with flights heading anywhere where there might be some sunshine. But what are the chances of a white Christmas here? We'll have the hot news on the cold front. Missing out how the man who took this picture failed to snap up a fortune. A dog's life, people are already abandoning those Christmas pets. And the curse of the Somerset Chapel, has it been lifted at last? The traditional stay-at-home Christmas apparently doesn't satisfy everyone these days. More and more people who can spare the time and the money are jetting off to sunnier spots for the festive break. Bristol Airport was jam-packed today, but if you missed out, then travel agents say that next week isn't too late to take a bargain break. Jill Hoyle has the story. Half past six this morning and there wasn't an empty seat in the departure lounge at Bristol Airport. By this evening, 6,000 passengers will have been airlifted to a Christmas holiday in the sun. Most popular destinations, Malta, Mallorca and Tenerife. Uh, much rather be in the sun than uh, be here in the cold at the end of the day. Just something different, really. We get fed up with Christmas every year, so we thought we'd make something really different. It's my birthday and Christmas present off there. And I don't even know where I'm going. Not yet, anyway. It's, uh, I'll win in a minute. Between 10 and 15 holiday flights have been leaving Bristol every day this week, heading for the sun, the sea, and hopefully a little bit of sanity. It wasn't all plain sailing for one holiday maker at Bristol Airport this morning. Security officials took the bang out of her Christmas crackers. On their way, and passengers were given a personal send-off by airport managing director Les Wilson. He says the growing popularity of holidays abroad at Christmas is just what the airport needs during the otherwise quiet winter months. During the winter months, the airport doesn't really make money at all. Uh, we make it very much in the summer, and we just see ourselves through in the winter. But a boost over Christmas New Year is tremendous. It really does help uh, a tr uh, an awful lot, because uh, the next boost we'll get will be Easter, quite a way. <laughs> These people certainly aren't dreaming of a white Christmas this year, unless, of course, it's the colour of the sand on the Costa del Sol. They know in just a couple of hours' time, they'll be a long way away from the cold and damp British weather and delays on the roads. And an added bonus, no repeats on television for them this Christmas. Jill Hoyle, HTV News at Bristol Airport. Well, back home, as if you hadn't noticed, it's already been the wettest December on record. But today's sunshine gave the West Country a bright new look, if only briefly. But the weathermen are now talking about flurries of sleet and snow. So for all those who haven't jetted away to the sun or the ski slopes, the big question is, are we going to have a white Christmas? Weather-wise, this was the state of play in Bristol today. Brilliant sunshine, no sign of snow. And this was the image on Exmoor, as seen on a Christmas card. And this was the scene in 1963, but it wasn't Christmas. So what is the answer? Will it or won't it? More to the point, what do the West Country public want? Snow, definitely snow. <laughs> no, I've had enough of that this year already. A white one, a uh, warm sunny one. <laughs> no snow, no. Oh, white one. No white Christmas, thank you very much. Well, I've come to the right place to find out. Of course, I'm at the Bristol Weather Centre, and Neil's got the answer. Come on then, Neil, do your best. Well, certainly it looks like there will be a little bit of sleet and snow around. There's some rain coming in from the west. It's certainly going to be cold enough for that to turn to sleet and snow overnight tonight. It will be falling overnight, so I don't think we will see any snow falling during the day tomorrow. The snow will mainly be confined to the high ground, I think around the Cotswolds and the Mendip Hills and on Exmoor. So the lucky few living up on those hills may just see a covering of snow on Christmas morning. They always box a little bit clever, don't they? Well, they're amongst the most stunning pictures ever taken of a mid-air collision. But the amateur photographer who took them didn't know that his snaps from the Fairford Air tattoo last July could have netted him a fortune if only he'd put them up for sale at the time. Well, thousands of people at the show watched in horror as two Russian jet fighters crashed. 
Hundreds pictured that tragedy, but no one caught that moment quite like Ronald Richards. It was an unforgettable scene. Two Russian MiG-29 fighters performing an aerobatic display at Fairford. It went horribly wrong. 800 feet above the ground, they collided, burst into flames and crashed to the ground. There were many photos of the incident, but none like Ronald Richards. In these stunning shots, the white-helmeted pilot is visible in the cockpit. The stricken MiG folds under the impact, then the fuselage erupts in a ball of orange flame, and finally, the most dramatic shot of all, the pilot, Sergei Trezviatsky, ejecting to safety seen clearly in the top right of the photo. They really are quite amazing pictures. The depth of detail there is, is quite fantastic. I've not seen pictures like this of the accident before anywhere. A report on the crash is due out in January. Its recommendations may stop amateur photographers getting such photos again. They've normally had photo buses taking the public onto the operational side when the flying is in progress. This is now deemed to be so dangerous uh, as a result of this accident that it won't happen again at future shows. Miraculously, no one was killed in this crash and both pilots lived to fly another day. Photographer Ronald Richards is oblivious of his fame. He's on holiday and still doesn't know his exceptional photographs could have earned him up to £100,000 if he'd had them developed at the right time. Marcus Dare, HTV News. Incredible pictures. Police in Wiltshire have released security video which shows a woman being frog-marched through a shopping centre by a robber. The woman who works at a newsagent's in Marlborough was accosted by the man as she took the shop's takings to a post office. The woman was forced to walk to a car park where the man grabbed the bag containing £2,000. She was shocked but unhurt. Police are appealing for witnesses. Plans for a huge members-only shopping warehouse have been announced today in Bristol. Developers are looking at a site in Arnas Vale near the new St. Philip's Causeway. The store would be similar to the American chain Costco, which has just opened its first British branch in Essex. But Bristol conservation groups oppose the scheme and want a public inquiry. It says the giant cut-price store would threaten local shops. Well, every year the RSPCA urge people not to give pets for Christmas unless they're absolutely certain that the new owners want them and they'll look after them. Well, despite all those warnings, you know, thousands of kittens and pups are abandoned sometimes within hours and the situation is getting worse. In some parts of the West Country, you know, people have already started discarding those unwanted pets. Staff at this animal centre near Gloucester, like any other, are preparing for the post-Christmas rush they don't want, but which is inevitable dogs and cats that are unwanted presents. It's always worse at this time, but sadly, pets are being abandoned all year round. It's getting worse. It's supposed to be a nation of animal lovers, but it's far beyond that now. We're tending to run full capacity virtually right throughout the year now. Um, Christmas time just puts an extra boost on it. Well, here's a classic example of uh, people's lack of responsibility when it comes to looking after a dog. This little Yorkshire Terrier, his pedigree, nine weeks old, and he was brought in because the owners said they couldn't house train him at nine weeks. The centre doesn't just provide a haven for cats and dogs. It'll take any animal in need of tender loving care. The goats and sheep brought here because they're unwanted are permanent fixtures. The donkey, so popular with children, was rescued because it was cruelly treated. The Whitminster Centre sees too many cruelty cases, like this greyhound knocked down after it was left to roam wild. Their advice is to think very seriously before taking on the responsibility of a pet. It's part of the family and it should be treated as part of the family. Um, it should be exercised with the family, it should be taken out with the family, fed the same as the family. If you had to think of some advice to give people who are thinking about having a, a dog for Christmas, what would it be? Don't. <laughs> Basically, just don't even consider it for Christmas, because we guarantee it'll be in here within two days after Christmas. The message then is loud and clear. Any pet, whether it be a rabbit, a cat or a dog, isn't just for Christmas, it's for life. Simon Whitby, HTV News, Gloucestershire. Perhaps it'll be a different story next Christmas. We'll take a short break now. Coming up now, how they're lifting the curse that's kept a historic Somerset chapel locked and empty for a quarter of a century.
Welcome back. Well, they sang carols by candlelight to lay a curse to rest and to celebrate an occasion that just a few years ago no one believed could actually happen. The Congregational Chapel at Froome, which dates back two and a half centuries, was closed in 1968 after a bitter row. People say that it bears a curse, but now it's been given a new lease of life. John Doyle reports. <laughs> The invitation to the carol service at Froome included the somewhat unusual plea, bring your own chairs and candles. The old congregational chapel at Rook Lane is only halfway through a major restoration plan, costing half a million pounds. It's still without lighting and furniture. Once, it was the leading congregational chapel in Britain. Its grandiose architectural splendor, a living legend. But in 1968, amid a bitter row, the chapel was closed and put up for sale. The then minister, Charles White, decreed that anyone trying to buy the chapel or change it would never prosper. And that prophecy became tragically true for a whole chain of property developers who got involved with the building. They all went bankrupt, and several of them had a narrow escape when the interior walls suddenly fell down without warning. Over the years, the chapel fell victim to vandals and decay but it's now being restored by the Somerset Building Preservation Trust. It's earmarked as a community centre or even a town hall. But when it's finished, local congregationalists hope they can use it on Sundays. Last night's carol service, they say, could finally signal an end to the curse that's dogged the old chapel for a quarter of a century. John Doyle, HTV News, Froome. Well, they're in good voice and in good spirit. Let's hope everything works out for them, don't we? Yes, we do. Now, not many of us would choose to celebrate Christmas out of doors alongside a busy main road, but that's exactly where villagers at Middlezoy in Somerset will be eating their turkey tomorrow. They're blockading the site Somerset County Council want for a traveller's camp, and their round-the-clock vigil won't end just because it's Christmas. It's the most unusual Christmas ever in the village of Middlezoy. Even over the festive season, there's no let-up in the blockade of the entrance to a proposed gypsy camp. Oh. <laughs> that right. But that won't stop the traditional video. Christmas dinner. Yeah. In a caravan opposite the site, protesters will be able to enjoy all the usual trimmings in very unusual surroundings. At home, of course, it's all quiet. There's no one at home. I've done nothing at home. No, nope, me neither. The Christmas is here. <laughs> and everybody contributed stuff. We've yeah. had the turkey contributed, the wine. Christmas pudding, ham, you name it, decorations have all been contributed by people to help us give us a good time. I wouldn't have thought last Christmas I'd have ever dreamed of doing something like this. It's new to all of us. I mean, none of us have ever spent Christmas in a lay-by before. But I think, actually, it's probably going to be a, a Christmas that we're all going to remember for the rest of our lives. Around 14 people will be eating Christmas dinner in the windswept caravan a bleak contrast to the home comforts of Middlezoy itself. For Julie Seifert, Christmas Day will be divided between her family and the picket line. After Christmas dinner with her husband and children, she'll be off to do her stint on the barricades. I find the people with the, that haven't got children will go up and do, do the morning one. And then us with kids will go up when we can. The new year will bring the threat of eviction from the site. But peace or no peace, the protesters are determined to enjoy their outdoor Christmas. Bob Constantine, HTV News, Middlesoy. What a determined group in the man's right, isn't he? They won't forget this Christmas in a hurry, will they? Now, for all you sports fans and couch potatoes, here's Angus. He's got a preview of the sporting feast that's available for all of us from Boxing Day onwards. Angus. Thanks, Bruce. The Christmas soccer program has rewarded footballers with some advantages and some disadvantages. Even though they'll be able to enjoy their turkey and mince pies and won't have to train on Christmas Day for a change, they will have to play two matches in two days. Dennis Rofe joins me. Dennis, do you think two matches in two days is too much? I think it is, uh, bearing in mind this time of year when the grounds are very, very heavy now. Uh, there'll be a lot of tired legs, uh, a lot of minor knocks and bruises that take a day or two to recover and, and they won't literally have time between one match to the next. And it's difficult, some will be playing their home games, jumping on the coach, travelling north or wherever they're going to play their second game. And I think it's a bit unfair in this uh, 
season where we're, we're saying we play too much football already. Thanks, Dennis. For two managers, the Christmas fixtures mean they'll be spending at least part of the festive period amongst old friends. Swindon's four matches start with a Boxing Day clash against fifth-placed Arsenal. They then travel to Sheffield Wednesday on Wednesday, followed on New Year's Day by the intriguing clash against Chelsea. It'll be former manager Glenn Hoddle's first trip back to the county ground with his Stamford Bridge side. The Christmas campaign for Bristol City also throws up a number of intriguing encounters. After City have travelled to West Brom and Grimsby and played host to 10th place Nottingham Forest, an old favourite of Ashton Gate returns to BS3, Joe Jordan. Bob Taylor, 50 league goals in his Bristol City career, 13 goals already this season for newly promoted West Brom. Stan Collymore, the top marksman in the division, 16 this term and plenty more where that came from. Joe Jordan, once an idol at Ashton Gate, guiding City to promotion three years ago, now in his third spell as a manager, trying to keep Stoke City in the stylish mould in which his predecessor, Lou Macari, left them. But perhaps the most interesting reunion will be at the county ground. Not quite the smiles from the chairman that greeted Glenn Hoddle's arrival at Stamford Bridge now, as they wallow in 20th place. On New Year's Day, perhaps Hoddle will regret ever leaving Swindon. Do you think he will regret leaving Swindon? I think he may think he's jumped out the frying pan into the fire. Uh, it's very easy with hindsight to look back and say, yes, he should have stayed there. Uh, I think uh, if he can come through this, it will certainly prove Glenn's worth as a manager. There will be great atmosphere, though, at the county ground on New Year's Day, though, won't they? It certainly will, and I think Swindon have done the hard part now. They've got themselves level with Southampton, so they haven't got a points deficit to make up now at the bottom of the league. You hope that the atmosphere that will be there will be enough to spur them on to victory. I mean, look at the men that Bristol City have got to come across. Bob Taylor in form, Stan Collymore always in form, apparently. Yes, that's right. Uh, they did exceptionally well to contain Bull and uh, Kelly in the last home game. They've got those two to contend with now, so there's interesting games coming up for them. And Joe will be coming down with your new club, Stoke. Yes, that's right. Uh, I don't know whether Joe has actually been back to Ashton Gate since he left. Uh, I know he held the place and, and had a great fondness for it. Um, so it'll be an interesting trip back for Joe. Indeed, thanks, Dennis. For Bristol Rovers, the campaign could hardly get off to a more daunting start at home to league leaders Reading. From then on, they'll hope it gets easier with battles against two Welsh sides, Wrexham and Swansea, before travelling to Bloomfield Road to try and turn off Blackpool's promotion illuminations. Dennis, that's going to be a difficult uh, way to start off the campaign against Reading. Yes, it is. Top of the table team. I've seen Reading on numerous occasions this year and they're playing some very good football. And obviously Jimmy Quinn is uh, the man in form, banging in the goals. They will have to watch him very closely. He does keep scoring goals, doesn't he? How do you stop him? Well, you've got to mark him very tight. Uh, but Jimmy can go through the game for long periods and not appear to be doing very much. And all of a sudden he pops up and gets vital goals. Rovers will be keen to get back on the rails after a disappointing result at Bournemouth last week. And then they, they then face that game with Reading and then have to jump on the coach and get up to North Wales where the weather's not too good up there. No, it's not. Dennis, thanks very much for joining us. Let's not forget Bath City and Yeovil who play each other twice in a week. First encounter is at Hewish on Monday. Some other notable events happening this weekend. Cricketer Sid Lawrence heads off down under in an attempt to resurrect his fragile cricketing career. He'll be playing for Sydney club Randwick for three months after which he'll make a decision about his future. Next Tuesday, a Chepstow Somerset trainer, Martin Pipe, will try and make it five Welsh Grand National victories in six years. Pipe, who saddled the first four home last year, again has the market favourite, Riverside Boy, second last year, currently nine to four with the bookies. But for the moment, that's the sport. Patsy. <laughs> well done. Thanks very much, Angus. Well, now, of all the Christmas traditions, school nativity plays have to be among the most enjoyable and heartwarming. But one very special production has been staged this year by a group of four to 11-year-olds in Bristol. And to do it, they've had to overcome enormous adversity, including having thousands of pounds worth of equipment stolen. Miming the nativity was second nature to the youngsters from Elmfield School in Bristol, especially as their first language is sign language. We caught up with them during a dress rehearsal for their Christmas show. For many, it was their first time on stage, in particular the infants who had the delight of telling their friends what they wanted for Christmas. Mm, I hope Father Christmas will... I really hope that Father Christmas will give me a present, a motorbike. And sure enough, his dream came true. 
but the Christmas story was brought to life as the junior school children took to the stage. Because there were hearing people in the audience, all the scenes were narrated, first in speech and then in sign language. A long time ago, a lady called Mary and her husband Joseph traveled far to a town called Bethlehem. They were very tired and wanted a place to sleep. They knocked on many a door, asking for a place to stay. Well, this was a dress rehearsal, and I asked the children how they felt about the real thing. And Claire told me her mum, dad and sister will see her. She didn't want them to, but at least she'll be in disguise. And Martin told me there'd be lots of people looking at him and he'd feel really embarrassed. Certainly no need to be. The audience had a wonderful time and the youngsters loved it. Weren't they all wonderful? Anyway, now let's turn to the weather. You know, so much talk about a white Christmas. Will it or won't it? Anyway, the outlook is so important, isn't it? In case we're going to pop out for the out of doors for the next few days. I think Give if, it to us again. If you're on the hills, you'll be okay for snow. But if you're where you are and where I am and where Patsy is and everyone else, <laughs> I don't think we're going to have any at all. But um, cold, dry and bright, I think. Okay, let's take a look at the tight, not the tight times, of course, no, the weather picture. And this one comes from Claire Shepherd who's seven years old and goes to Cadbury Heath School in Warmley. Thank you, Claire. And I'll be back with the full forecast very shortly. William, coming up to the end of the programme, we still have time to give you the summary of the day's main stories, both here in the West and elsewhere. Police are hunting a group of youths who raped two schoolgirls in South London. The girls, aged 14 and 15, were dragged into an alleyway next to a burger restaurant in Catford. Police are searching for the parents of three children, aged five, four and one, abandoned at their home in Leeds with little food or bedding. In the West, it was standing room only at Bristol Airport today as thousands of families flew out for Christmas in the sun. And the problems of pets abandoned at Christmas is getting worse. This year in the West, dozens of animals have been dumped in the run-up to Christmas. And those are the latest headlines. Well, if you've been with us this week, you'll know that we've been taking time out to feature a carol from a local school choir. Well, to bring this little series to an end is the choir of Holyrood School down at Chard in Somerset. Lovely, and thanks very much indeed to all the choirs. Finally, you know, we wish you a very, very happy Christmas. You know, our special thoughts are with the folk who are in hospital or who are sick like Sue Meeker of St George in Bristol. Speedy recovery to you all. Yes, and that applies particularly to children, of course. And we must thank you for all your lovely Christmas cards. You've been very kind, haven't they? Well, actually, I'm going to be ever so brave. I've actually gone along to Bruce and Pat's desks, <laughs> and I found all these wonderful cards. Look at, so oh, look at this. It's not all, all of, of them. It's not all of them. It's some of them, like ones from Don and Glenis Patamore of Chard. Yes, Dave Sheila and David Locke from Swindon. Angus, who have you got? Joan Tandy from uh, Western Supermare. And Dennis? Stella Scott from Cannington. Well, there you are. I wish we could mention you all. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy your Christmas. Mind how you go. We're back with you again on Wednesday. Have a wonderful time. See you, see you soon.